Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, now Mike Arsenal, and many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Our sponsor today is Acuity Scheduling. They help automate client bookings, cancellations, and reminders. I use it personally to book my guests at Inspired Insider because it saves me hours of back and forth emails, coordinating schedules with busy people like Mike, and it's one of the top three tools I use to save me tons of time. Uh, today we have Mike Arsenal, he's co-founder of Rejoiner. Rejoiner is a software for e-commerce companies that helps drive faster revenue growth. Who doesn't want that, Mike? They have helped over a thousand companies, including Gas, Hallmark, many more. To date, their customers have generated an additional, and I looked at their website just now, $68,268,268.79 ,268 <laughs> in revenue using their software. And Mike's going to talk about how that is an actual real number and where that's hooked into. They have a strong value proposition that I noticed when I go on, on their site. It says, done, and I know that you've thought you know, hard about this, mm -hmm. done with you service by a team of e-commerce email marketing experts with a guaranteed ROI every month. Mm -hmm. Mike, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. We could break down this introduction for the whole interview. <laughs> um, about the messaging and the dollar. So tell tell us what that's hooked into because you're like, that's a real number when I read it yeah, to you yeah. before. So that revenue counter on our site is basically hooked into our database. Yeah. And on, a, on an hourly basis, we aggregate the attributable revenue from the campaigns that we run and it tallies uh, on our site. Um, and that's pretty cool because I feel like a lot of those counters that you see on other software sites are actually, they're just like spinning. It's the same number every time. When you go back <laughs> it looks cool, but it's just like, <laughs> right, right. It's just spinning it. So tell people, how have people generated this with your software? What are, what are people doing that's working? Right. So we are, um, it, the, the software itself is a, we, we refer to it as a life cycle email solution. Yeah. I noticed that. I'm like, tell, tell us what that means. Life cycle email solution. Right. So you know, pretty much every relationship that an e-commerce company has with an individual customer has a life cycle, has a beginning and an end. Mm -hmm. And engagement kind of increases over time as customers uh, come back to your site, make mm -hmm. their first purchase, make mm -hmm. their second, third, fourth. Hopefully, they become a loyal customer. But yeah. fortunately, for most businesses, that engagement peaks at some point. Yeah. And engagement Tell starts, me. Yeah. When does that starts, peak? starts to trail off. Well, it's different for every business okay. and it's different for every customer. And so what our software is designed to do is, is recognize where customers are at in the life cycle and trigger communications, email in this case, which are relevant to that customer based on where they are uh, in the customer life cycle. So mm -hmm. are they a new customer? Are they an existing customer? Are they uh, a dormant customer? Have they lapsed? And they're all different campaigns that you can run throughout the life cycle. Yeah. So can you tell me, break down one individual customer case study and what that looked like in the beginning, middle and end, and what different campaigns get shot out that you found worked? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, let, let's 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 use an example here. Um, we've got a customer who's a large. They're a big pet. Um, they're a pharmacy for for pets, mm. right? Um, and there's like ten or eleven of these who are licensed uh, on the internet. It's very small, uh, very small group of businesses who can sell this kind of uh, these pharmacy products for animals. And so they would come to us typically and they would say, well, you know, we've got this problem. Um, you know, we think we've got a, a shopping cart abandonment problem on our site. Yeah. Customers are starting transactions, but they're not finishing them. And so oftentimes new customers will start with us solving that specific problem. So we'll run what's called a shopping cart abandonment campaign. Which so they're using something else maybe or nothing at all? It's usually nothing, but they're typically yeah. measuring the problem in some sort of other analytics tool. So typically Google Analytics. Mm -hmm. so they can see that they've got you know, a million customers who start the checkout process every month but don't complete it, but they don't really have any idea what's going on in between. I see. Uh, so that's one that, that typically we start with. And then after we launch a successful card abandonment campaign, we usually expand into one of two places, either uh, potentially a welcome series for customers who are purchasing for the first time. That's another one. 
Um, or another big opportunity is what we call a win back campaign, which targets customers who uh, haven't been back to your site to purchase in quite a while. Mm -hmm. And we try to really hone in on you know, what is what are the typical reorder periods? Yeah. Like, how long does it take a first time customer to make their second purchase? Right. And once we establish that baseline, let's say it's 32 days, we know that a, a win back campaign should be triggered at day 33 right. for any customer who hasn't made their purchase by yeah. then. Um, so, so what does it turn three. out to be for like the pet? What's uh, if someone's in the pet space? What sh what's the typical like well, reorder? It's, it's, that's a great that's a great business model because every product that they sell is consumable, and they know the typical consumption period right. for every SKU on the site. Yeah, and so even in the you know the product names, it's a thirty day supply, sixty day supply, ninety day supply. So that gives us a lot of great data to be able to trigger reorder campaigns that are relevant. Um, for that right. particular customer, it's like you know I wear contact lenses, and I get a reorder email on the usually within the exact week that I run out of contact lenses, right. and it's completely frictionless where I just have to click through that email, right. and there it is. There's my order. I just have to click buy, and that's the experience. They got you. <laughs> yeah, they got <laughs> those me. people should be on Rejoiner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so, what about what what works well with the Welcome series that you found? Because I'm sure. People go in and just put whatever they want. Um, what's worked well with your expertise? Because you see it across a bunch of different industries. Yeah, Welcome Series is really cool because actually it capitalizes. On Real the quick, site. Mike, um, your call, just the oh. mic keeps hitting that. So I just want to make sure I hear you. So I don't know if you want to like unzip it a little bit. Yeah, or zip it up. Yeah, exactly. Um, so go on. Yeah, so the Welcome Series. Yeah, so it's cool because it capitalizes on this idea of recency. Which is actually that the the most likely customer to make a second purchase is the one who just made their first purchase, mm -hmm. and the likelihood of that goes down as every day goes by mm -hmm. after that first purchase yeah. is made. Which may so, be counterintuitive, maybe saying like people think, "Well, I don't want to bother this person," right? But you're saying the opposite. I, I'm saying the opposite. Yeah, it's actually that's the moment you should be asking for the second sale. Mm. And so that's really what a welcome series. So yeah, is. tell me what that looks like. It's like you just purchased buy this. Or what, how, right. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, so we, we use it as an opportunity to do two things. The yeah. first one is to uh, try to reduce any buyer's remorse that could um, that, you know, that could be present. And so it's about telling the story of the company that they just purchased from. Mm. What are what's their unique value proposition? Yeah. What are you know the benefits? Why should this person uh, be like super psyched that they just made a purchase yeah. from you? Tell that story. Yeah. Um, we What's like the hide. best story you heard? Because people are bad about telling their story too. What's, what have you coached someone through or what's the best one that someone on your platform uses that yeah. we should look at as a model? I think it's, it's usually that they forget that making a human connection is the most important part of it. So tell the story. Tell their story. Like If they're the founder of the company and they started this really cool e-commerce business, like why are they not sharing that with their customers? Mm -hmm. And so the way that can sometimes manifest is like we'll do like a, a letter from a founder where it's like you yeah. know hey you know my name's jeremy i founded this really cool e-commerce business here's my story here's why mm -hmm. i do this this is what motivates me um you know this is what's really cool about our company mm -hmm. and it's a really powerful way to connect with people who just bought with you yeah. uh, from you for the yeah. first time yeah and you live that because you have a letter from the founder on your site which i read yeah right? yeah <laughs> so what tell me about you for a second i want to get into the welcome story but i also want to circle back to why you created rejoiner and so so now's as good a time of any as any <clears throat> why what's your story why did you end up creating rejoiner sure um so gosh this goes back six or seven years ago i was uh working for uh, a software company yeah in, in grasshopper Boston. yeah grasshopper yep yep as a product manager and we we're experiencing a, pro experiencing a problem ourselves where their uh, sort of e-commerce conversion process is we didn't have any salespeople. So it's a, it's a, a software product where you kind of just go on the site, you pick a phone number. Background is that it's a, uh, a phone system for, for small businesses. Yeah, to make and, you look larger and also it redirects calls to, yeah, exactly. I'm very familiar. Yeah, like if it calls a number, it redirects you to, you know, who whatever number you know, press one for whatever, you know, this salesperson, press two for the president or whatever. Yep. Yeah. 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 Right. 
So um, their sales process is unlike, you know, just like most online businesses is driving a ton of paid traffic into a funnel and there's they're acquiring customers on sign up pages, right? Yeah. And we discovered that we had a huge shopping cart abandonment problem that there hmm. were an enormous amount of customers who were starting this process but not yeah. completing it. And we yeah. didn't have any technology to track when that happened. Yeah. So with two colleagues, we built a prototype of the initial um, you know, just a very targeted use case of, of tracking shopping cart abandonment or, or checkout abandonment. Mm-hmm. And we deployed that onto Grasshopper. And we, we basically uncovered all of these hidden customers mm-hmm. that we hadn't previously known existed before that. And we said, wow, okay, so what, like, we've got all this data. What are we going to do with it? Like, what are the best ways to follow up with these customers to get them to come back and convert? Uh, so we tried calling them, we tried emailing them, we tried live chat, um, yeah. and it turned out that uh, you know, email was the yeah. most effective tool. Right. And so that was the initial very narrow problem yeah. that we solved, and it just it, yeah. it grew from there. I love that rough sketch of, because that's the early days conception of the product. Totally. Um, so what was working well with email? Because maybe you're just a good emailer as opposed to like a phone, you know, phone sales. Like, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think there were a couple of things that made it appealing. Um, yeah. uh, having customer service reps follow up is very expensive. Um, had a higher conversion rate, but uh, was was not you know, sort of um, cost effective based on who, what we were able to recover. Right. Uh, an email is great because it's scalable. It's automated. It's very easy to test. Yeah. Um, the infrastructure exists to send email fairly. You know, affordably. Yeah. Um, and so it ended up that that was the the direction that we went with. So are you a, like a hardcore coder? How did you get this done? I'm not. This seems no, complicated. I, um, I myself am not a coder. Um, so when I re- when we originally built the prototype for the technology, I had two technical colleagues, two technical co-founders, technically, um, that built the initial version of the technology. Yeah. So what have you found with the psychology of? why all these people are abandoning right at that point you're, you were probably seeing these this data of holy cow like all these people are like ready to check out and they're just leaving right what have you found with your experience why yeah it's different for every business yeah. um yeah if, it, if it's an e-commerce company who's selling physical goods it usually it has something to do with you know some kind of unanswered questions mm-hmm. or um, you know, a lot of times it's shipping related, either it's not fast enough or it's mm-hmm. too expensive or, it, you know, and then it's interesting. And then there are a whole class of things that uh, related to payment errors and bugs on the site, and user experience problems mm. that, that people have that oftentimes the retailer doesn't even know about until customers start bringing it to their attention. So mm-hmm. that happens a lot too. Yeah. Um, in Grasshopper's case, you know, I, I think it, it was definitely most concerns were in the unanswered questions category. They just weren't sure how the service was going to work or how billing was going to work. And so sending that follow-up email was the opportunity to continue the conversation and get those questions answered. Yeah, which I think that's because the psychology is exactly what you include in the welcome part of the or the part of the abandonment sequence so totally yeah so knowing that is probably huge so people can maybe if there's certain things do you suggest people talk to a customer who did like what how did they get those insights so they know what to include in those emails well that's actually the more important part of these campaigns as far as 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 far as we're concerned right it's like sure it's great that a, a percentage of customers will just click through these emails by default and complete their order right but the real opportunity is actually to gather that qualitative feedback about what's causing not to customers to convert in the first place. Right, right. Because you can take all of those insights and proactively include them like right. in your checkout process, address right. those concerns up front. Um, and really the best way that we've found to gather those insights is just to ask. So yeah. that first email is, that you send is usually mm. very customer service focused. Well, you know, was there a problem? How can we help you? Um, just feel free to hit reply and some, you know, human being will get back to you. Yeah. And customers, when you, when you ask them to do that are, are very likely to provide feedback if they didn't have a good experience. Yeah. yeah. I like that verbiage. A human being will get back to you. <laughs> right. That's a good one. I mean, cause people get into this robot mode, like, Oh, it's just the company just emailing me. Yeah. yeah. They're not, there's not someone, they don't picture actually someone behind it. So right. I wrote that down cause I need to use that in my emails. 
uh, there's a human being that will get back to you. Like, uh, put it put it in the subject line. Like, this is not an automation. <laughs> <laughs> I am a human. Um, so what have you found some interesting reasons why people abandon? Because you've probably heard it all at this point. We've heard it all. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think like the, the, the really interesting ones are where a retailer is attracting a subset of customers that they didn't even know were coming to their site. And they have like like international customers who are really keen on their product and they really want to buy from them, mm-hmm. but they are unable to do so because of like, you know, their currency, currency issues or payment method issues. And for the retailer, it, it enables them to like unlock this audience, this group of customers that they didn't even really know existed before. Mm-hmm. So I'm, a, I'm looking at a bunch of the success stories and testimonials. So um, like VTech, yep. um, electronics, why do people abandon an electronics tend to abandon electronics uh, shopping cart? Um, that one's probably on price, I would say, most often. Uh, mm-hmm. Price and shipping. Don't they know the price when they're clicking through, though? I mean, it's like, okay, so it's more shipping. Yeah, you know, sometimes these, these retailers... They get cold feet or something? What? They get cold feet, yeah. Sometimes there's, like, unexpected upsells and cross-sells in the cart that spook people. Hmm. Um, or shipping costs are not revealed like early enough in the process. That's a pretty common one. And so somebody builds a cart and then they get to the final checkout page and they're like, whoa, it's like, you know, seven day shipping is going to cost me like an extra 15 bucks. And that's enough to, to spook someone. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what are some big, you know, talking about that, because that even goes before they even get to the cart, there's mistakes people are making on their site. So what are some big mistakes that you find e-commerce sellers are making even before someone hits the cart. Yeah, I would say the biggest one is that transparency issue where it's just like not clear to the customer what the true cost is going to be. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we always recommend like, I, we're, we're in, in this day and age, I think most consumers are expecting uh, free shipping, completely free shipping or um, free shipping over a certain, if the order size reaches a certain threshold, it's going to be free shipping. Mm-hmm. And so, um, if a retailer is not doing that, that's something that we always recommend that they they look at just because, you know, unfortunately, Amazon has created a situation where everybody expects that. Yeah. So the welcome series, the story is really important. The win back series, right? Um, mm-hmm. You kind of gauge what's your customer life cycle of what they're buying. Um, what's next after the win back? Um. VIP customer programs are mm-hmm. pretty popular. So that's where you basically define a, a, a set of rules around like, okay, who are my best customers? Mm-hmm. Is it based on the total number of transactions? Is it based on total spend or right. average order value? And that's different for every business. Right. Um, but, but being able to trigger a campaign that is meant to thank your best customers for their loyalty, yeah, um, that's a really powerful one. What's a good way to thank customers, VIP customers? Because you don't always want to train them to look for a deal, and right. they're your best customers. So, what they're are some ways? Definitely not, them? definitely not a deal, yeah. because these are your best customers, right? So they're going to purchase anyway, right? And so uh, we always recommend again taking a very personal approach. And since you know it's really powerful to connect with either the founder or like you know somebody senior at a company that that's what the the communication should look like is that mm-hmm. it's a almost a handwritten note that says like you know thanks for your business we really you know we appreciate you and you know it's just about making that recognizing that that's a great customer and making mm-hmm. them and, and letting them know anything beyond recognizing that you find has worked um, we, we typically just do the recognition. Okay. Um, we have customers who then come back and say, well, you know, I want to incentivize them to keep purchasing. Them. Right. So we want to do an incentive. So that works well too. But we usually just recommend. Like, yeah. The, I'm just wondering if there's any, you don't want to train them to get a discount. If there's any incentive without giving like a discount that you find works for VIP customers. Yeah, certainly. I think um, something like giving them early access to, you know, um, if you have new product launches, mm, I see. they could potentially, you know, get involved in, in the product development process. So it's like definitely giving them access to exclusive programs, I think, is another another direction you could go. Mm-hmm. So the welcome series gets triggered when someone purchases or if, if they abandon or both. Um, so the welcome series would target first time purchasers. Okay. 
um, so different triggers on a different event than a, a an abandoned okay. car. Yeah. So tell me about what people should be thinking about when someone does abandonment. What gets triggered with with that? Sure. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a couple of different directions that you can go with with card abandonment campaigns. Um, we always recommend you take a segmented approach. So it's basically not all transactions are created equal, right? Not all customers are are equal, and so. Right. Um, from a segmentation standpoint, we, we recommend like uh, segmenting out high value and low value transactions, and maybe you should have different approaches depending on mm. the value of the cart that the customer abandoned. Yeah. Um, the other thing that you can do is if you have particularly high margin product categories, you can target those. Maybe be a little bit more aggressive in categories where you have more margin. But I think so, like offering a discount or something, or what? What would aggressive look like? Yeah, yeah. So in some cases, it does make sense to give some kind of offer if the customer has expressed interest in a, um, you know, something that there's there's room to give that offer away. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. for low value transactions, you probably don't want to give away give away the margin. Yeah. Um, so from a high level, we always recommend that if you're going to do a discount, that you test it so that there, you know, you, you try a campaign with no offers, no incentives, and test that against one where. Uh, you are using some kind of promotion, and that just makes sure that you're not giving away margin where you don't have to. Right. Um, right. So segmentation is really important. Testing is really important. But I think from a tone perspective, you want to make it very customer service focused. So it's all about how can we help this customer get their questions answered. Right. Right. Um, and that's and that's really what the focus of the, the campaign should be. Yeah. So I want to go back to your um, homepage for a second and. Mm -hmm. The because I know you spend a lot of time constructing the messaging, mm -hmm. so obviously intentionally you are done with you service, right? So I want you to talk about that, and then the guaranteed ROI every month is a bold statement to make. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll start with the done with you. Yeah. First, um, so the, the when we when we really got into like working with e-commerce companies, right? Because when we started the company it was just a little bit of technology that we were using for ourselves. And right. so we didn't know who we were going to sell it to yet. Yeah. And when we started to work with more and more retailers, specifically like sort of medium to large size retailers, we, we uncovered pretty quickly that despite, no matter how big they are, they're all resource constrained, right? They have maybe a small design team or a small marketing team. And a lot of the time they don't have people in house who focus exclusively on email. And email is kind of its own beast, right? Because it's a little tricky from a development standpoint, yeah. from a design standpoint. There are different constraints based on different email clients. There's a lot that goes into it. And the niche that we found worked really well for us was to say that we're not only going to provide the software, but we're also going to provide all of these services on the back end to help you execute on email creative. And so by done with you, what we mean is that you're using our software and our technology, but it's also our team that is like, building out campaigns for you, writing copy, doing the design work, mm -hmm. developing the templates, testing them across all of the email clients that mm -hmm. are out there. And so really it's kind of like email marketing in a box for e-commerce. They get the software and the team. So, that's right. what we so they don't have to go in and be like, okay, now I have to write these 20 emails for the yeah. welcome series and the win back series. They're kind of your best practiced emails are in there and they can modify it however they want, but they're in there type of thing? Well, it's not even best practices. I mean, everything that we do is custom. So it's like we take mm. a very... Oh, like, so you actually... Okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. So it's like we start from scratch with every client. And so wow. from a design perspective, from a copy perspective, so there are a lot of initial conversations about like, you know, what do you want this program to be? What do you want it to yeah. look like? What should it, you know really trying to understand what their goals are, what problems they're trying to solve. And then really every engagement is kind of a custom tailored approach, um, which is nice because the end product, uh, you know, we feel like is a lot better than something that's templatized where it's like, okay, you know, here's the template for the win back campaign, slap your logo on it. Uh, right. It's, it's, it's much different than that. You get a much more custom end product. I'm surprised you have as much hair as you do because this sounds like a real stressful situation. <laughs> 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 customizing all this i think i pull my ha hair out um because everyone has different thoughts and you may also think well this is what's worked even though someone may do you get pushback from people yeah absolutely but you know it's that's the cool part about it, is that it's a collaborative process right? right and so 
they're working with us because you know we know what we're doing right, right. So, so oftentimes you know whatever a client wants to do we either have very strong data to either back it up yeah. or say hey that's not the right not the right direction yeah so what's the biggest mistake that someone made because they didn't listen to you you know because obviously in the end they're going to do what they want to do and you're probably talking to founders or entrepreneurs who are you know used to making those decisions so yeah I want to hear about like a horror story and then they came back like, okay, Mike, you were right on this. Yeah. Well, I can tell you the most common one. Okay. It's it's actually fairly frequent is they say, well, you know, we don't actually need any of those services. We just want the software and we're going to do, we're going to design the emails. We're going to develop them ourselves. And in that case, you know, they're often asking for some kind of reduced rate because they're like, okay, you know, we just want the, we know how to do this. We don't need all this hand holding. Yeah, exactly. And then so one of two things usually happens, right? They'll usually launch their first campaign and there'll be some kind of, you know, like weird usability thing with their emails where it's like not rendering an Outlook or Gmail correctly or customers can't click on certain things. And so like it usually the technical gotchas with developing email are what usually go wrong when somebody tries to DIY because mm-hmm. it's just like so tricky across all of the clients and devices and rendering engines that are out there. It's just really tricky to do HTML email well uh, these days. Mm-hmm. And so usually it's a, it's a technical problem first. And then the second thing is that they have great intentions when they sort of ask for that. Like, okay, we're going to dedicate a lot of internal resources to building this program out. But then it's usually they develop one campaign and they're like, well, you know, like, our designer has a list of 30 other things they need to do. So like, we're never going to get to this. And so yeah, yeah. they usually, the program never becomes what they, what they hope it does, right, right. Uh, what they hoped it would. And so yeah, you know, like lack of resources and lack of uh, specifically technical expertise around developing email are two things that, that usually get people. So do you, do can people use the service DY, you know, for themselves or do they have to, you know, bring the team on to actually do that. Because I could see the success of the, they're going to blame the software, you know, yeah. instead of themselves for not executing the software. So do yeah. you even allow people on the software to do that? In very, in rare cases, yeah. we do. So really um, not that, not common. Yeah, not common. So and you say, were... this isn't for you, you need a different solution. Exactly. Yeah, we if for us, the most important thing for a great client engagement is that they actually find value in the collaboration, that we're not just a, a technology vendor, right. that they're working with us as a, you know, a trusted advisor yeah. and they value our, um, the expertise that we bring. Yeah. So how do you decide on price point? Because this seems really labor intensive for your team mm-hmm. to do this. Yeah. I mean, if you look at our prices, like you actually get a great deal for the price, but a lot of people come to that pricing page and they're like, whoa, a couple thousand bucks a month. Like that's, you know, that's a big number. Yeah, um, yeah I think the you, starting plan is a thousand a month, yep, right? Yep. Yeah. So we break down our pricing based on uh, a few different uh, dimensions. It's basically what part of the customer life cycle you want to target, mm-hmm. whether or not you Oh, want- I see. So the thousand is the recover. So it's more the life cycle of the card abandonment pre-purchase yep pre-purchase I got stuff, card abandonment yep and then the retain package is all of the post-purchase campaigns that we've talked about okay and so then you can do both with the optimized add-on exactly yeah okay. so opt- the, that add-on is is that our team will proactively a b test um all of your uh, all your campaigns for you mm-hmm. and so again on your home page you say it's guaranteed roi so tell yep. me about how you guarantee the roi yeah, um, so the, the guarantee comes in the fact that there's no uh, annual contract. So it's a month-to-month service. And so basically, if you're not happy with the return, uh, you can cancel. No questions asked. Um, the other way that we do that is in the first 30 days, we've got like a you know, like a 30-day money-back guarantee where we'll do all the work to get your first campaign set up, do the creative, um, integrate our software on your site. And then if for any reason during that first 30 days, you can you can opt out again, no questions asked. Yeah. So who is this good for? Because obviously if someone's coming, having 10 people come to their site, it's going to be hard to recoup that. Yeah. What level of business is, is good to use Rejoiner? For an e-commerce company, uh, there's there's a threshold, I think, in terms of traffic is really the, the important thing. So we usually say it's five or 6,000 unique visitors per month. Um, you know, for an abandonment campaign specifically, there needs to be at least a little bit of traffic moving through your checkout. Yeah, for sure. Um, 
and so that's 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 typically the, the the threshold that we use. But we have you know clients who are doing less than that, but maybe they have particularly high value customers, right? So in right. that case, it's worth it for them. Or very targeted traffic, and yep. yeah. Um, so I want to talk a little about your background, how this came to be with Rejoin, and I peppered you on questions about <laughs> about welcome campaigns. Um, but so a couple of fun facts, and most people may not know about you, Mike. Even it's not even in your letter. To, from the founder on your site is you're a kayak fisherman, which mm-hmm. is interesting. Did you just grow up with with this or? Um, well, I just love fishing in general. In general, so um, I've got the kayak. I've got. Where are you from boat. originally? I'm from Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Okay. Yep. And I, I live in Rhode Island now. I live in um, a, a, a town in southern Rhode Island called Newport, and the fishing is is great here. So yeah, I try to get out in the water as much as I can. So growing up, what did you want to do? When you grew up, um, that's that's a good question. I I always had very strong entrepreneurial tendencies. You did, yeah. From your parents, would yep. Uh, both my parents are entrepreneurs. Um, so, what kind of business that, were they in? Um, so my mom runs a very successful consulting practice, um, and my dad started uh, essentially a school uh, and residency hmm. program for people with uh, who are developmentally disabled. Really. Yep. Oh wow, that's amazing. And so they've both. What was his background to start a school like that? Um, He's a psychologist. Okay. And so he was working directly with kids who had you know learning disabilities, uh, more severe developmental disabilities, Hmm. and there was a gap. There was an education gap that Mm, he identified. So he opened a special school just for kids who have you know uh, disabilities that maybe couldn't be they couldn't be helped by the public school system. Mm. Um, and since th- that's, that's grown into assisted living programs and, mm. and on, you know, all different kinds of uh, you yeah. know, social services. So growing up, you saw that him create this. What what did you see from the background of what it took to do that? Yeah, I don't know if I knew like growing up that this was entrepreneurship, right? Because he wasn't necessarily starting a – it was not a for-profit business, but right. – he was growing something. Still, you're my, creating something from, strat, from scratch. From scratch, yeah. yeah. And he's building. He's building a team, and he's, you mm. know, in, in his case, there's a. He, he works closely with um, state government to get funding. Yeah. And so he faced almost, you know, all the same challenges that we face, just in a in a different yeah. different industry. Yeah. So, what big lessons did you learn from your parents? Um. I, I would say in both cases just sort of like tenacity um they've both been building the same business like it, both their respective businesses for 25 years mm. that success for either of them didn't come quickly yeah but once they reached that point it's been you know amazing for yeah. both of them but it took a really it took a really long time um and they continued to focus on the same businesses they didn't give up on either of them even though yeah. it took time yeah so did you have an idea? You knew you wanted to be an entrepreneur or do something like that. Yeah. Did you have an yeah. idea from what did you want to do when you were young? Well, my first, my first business was I started a landscaping company with my best friend in high school. Okay. Uh, and we did that for about four years throughout high school and into our first year of college. Um, mm-hmm. And that was – How did you my- get customers? Oh man, we did uh, we did some funny stuff. Well, we did a lot of uh, printing flyers and putting them on people's cars and <laughs> in parking lots at the mall. <laughs> um, that's how. That's probably how we got our first five or six. Customers. Really? So that worked? Yeah. Yeah, that actually worked. Yeah, yeah. And then from that point, it was all referrals. We would just ask people for for referrals. And honestly, we didn't really want to work that much in the summertime. So like, we had enough customers at, at one point. We were like, okay, this is, this is good. <laughs> you got fat and lazy. Yeah. Um, so as you got older, did you have an, start to have an idea of what type of business you wanted to be in? Um, no, actually. Um, as I got older, I, I knew that I wanted to create some kind of business. I didn't know what. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went to undergrad and focused on, on business and, yeah. and got, got a marketing degree. Yeah. And um, what made you – then you went on to Rhode Island School of Design. What made yeah. you decide to do that? Well, I, I, my first job out of college was with this really cool company called Continuum, which um, if you've heard of, have you ever heard of IDEO? Yeah, of course. Design consultancy. Yeah, so yeah. Similar product design. Oh, okay. Yep. So industrial design, graphic design, they were so doing- it's a similar type of company. 
yeah, physical product oh. design. They're doing service design, uh, brand identity, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering. So basically, like it's a one stop shop if you want to create a physical product. Like yeah. these are your guys. Yeah. And so there, I was exposed to. I think I, I developed a really strong appreciation for for design as you know, sort of uh, uh, a whole. But also, I saw a lot of entrepreneurs come through with these great ideas for new products. And, you know, we were executing on those ideas from start to, to finish. So right. coming up with the brand identity, coming mm. up with um, all of the, the, the copy around the brand, the packaging, and then actually developing the physical product as well. So it was really? kind of like, yeah. What watching. was the coolest one that you remember working on physical product wise? <sighs> hmm. I would say one that really jumped out at me actually was this team from Dartmouth and they came to us with this idea for like improving the efficiency of like tractor trailers and the amount of fuel that they consume. <laughs> That's like, random. Such a random idea, but yeah. it was so cool because they were basically had, had they had done the math and said like, you know, if we can improve the efficiency of these trailers by 1%, we'll save trucking companies like $50 billion in fuel over the course of the year, like some kind of crazy number. And so right. um, they had raised a little bit of outside capital and yeah. we were doing, design work for like what this thing would be that bolted on to the the trailer and mm. it was a really cool project so what was how did it work what was what would be bolted on a trailer to see the fuel well it's kind of like there was like these um you know kind of like uh, curved um flaps underneath the trailer that mm. reduced the amount of um air that could flow underneath the trailer while the trailer was moving yeah, yeah. there were also these fins on the back that kind of gave it a more aerodynamic um, as it you know moved through the air as right, you were right. driving. It gave it a more aerodynamic uh, shape, and so so that's what their invention was. Yeah, and just that small increase uh, in efficiency had this huge impact. Were they engineers? What were, what even made them think about this? These guys were MBAs actually. They were like what? doing doing so their MBA. Weird, though. With, yeah, and they um, well they were partnering with us for the engineering help right. to actually execute on the design. That um, is strange. It, and they went on to like commercialize that idea and they did they did really well. And like so you'll see like some trucks driving down the road that have like these crazy flaps on the back and, and That's why. Uh, yeah, that's why. That is random. Yeah. Like I don't even see how they get from A to Z. Like I interviewed one guy who now I can yeah. see this one, he developed a some attachment to a beer tap that made it come faster out and it reduced the foam. So oh, the, yeah. the amount of it comes up from the waste, bottom. Right, the amount of waste. So I could see, like, he just standing in line waiting for a beer and it was taking too long. So I could see, like, the need there. I don't see where these MBA people got to. That's the efficiency of a tractor, but whatever. Yeah. Um, so you – That's kind of a – that was a funny one. I mean, th th but we were working in so many different spaces, like the medical yeah. space. We yeah. Were working in, you know, what was a good – what was a cool medical product? Because I could see you going ADD, entrepreneur, with this thing. You're seeing all these ideas – this I think the coolest medical one that I that came through while I was there was um, it's a product called the Omnipod. Okay, and it's for people with diabetes. Hmm. And, and when you you know have diabetes, you have to give yourself insulin, you know, between one and four times a day, depending on on the severity of your diabetes. Yeah, and it's a it's a really tedious process to inject yourself with a needle that many times per day. Horrible, sounds so, horrible. Yeah. So what this product was was a little pod that actually sticks you know, to your side. Mm, I've seen those. Yeah. It delivers the insulin like intravenously in an automated way throughout oh. the day. It like syncs with your phone. That's, so, it's, that's... so it's measuring your blood glucose and wow. it's also delivering that's amazing. Uh, insulin. It was like, it's and really you cool. guys helped the product for this on that one. They did the, and I wasn't on the engineering team by any means, but like they literally designed the guts of the device. Wow. They, they did the industrial design for what this thing looks like. You know, there were huge discussions about the adhesive, like, because it has to stick on you for seven days and you, you have to be able to shower with it and, wow. and it's got to be able to stay on. So they did, yeah, pretty much from start to finish. So why, I could see you staying there for decades, right? Yeah. It's, it's really um intellectually stimulating and you're working on different projects what made you decide to leave yeah um i knew so at the time i was working on like mark i was working in marketing and business development for them and yeah. so i was helping with the sales process i was helping with you know sort of the um the online marketing of the company like 
you know, doing this, doing the website, writing case studies. And I'm just like a junior guy at this point, right? I'm just out of college. You were doing a lot of the technical side of things for like the, for the site. Marketing, marketing yeah. perspective. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I knew that was where I wanted to go deeper. That's what um, you liked. And I really was interested in uh, software development. Yeah. And so an opportunity came up at Grasshopper where this was, again, a really cool entrepreneurial story, yeah. which kind of attracted me to them. It's two guys from Babson, young guys who'd created this amazingly successful business with no outside capital. And they're like growing it right outside of Boston. They've got this great team. And so I was like, you yeah, know, this is a pretty cool opportunity. This would be you know, a great way to, to, to learn more about building a software product and, and how to get it to, um, you know, they were serving a market that I was interested in, mm-hmm. which was, you know, sort of SMB. Um, yeah, small businesses, like, yeah, small and medium businesses. size. Yep, yep. And they're doing this with, you know, online marketing. That's it. And, yeah. and there's no sales team. And so their, their business model was very interesting. Their story was very interesting. And I felt like, you know, they had just done this crazy thing where they had changed the name from Got V Mail to Grasshopper. And they sent out like 100,000 chocolate covered grasshoppers to all these people. So, like, I'm like, these guys are crazy. Like, I gotta get, I gotta like check this out. <laughs> Yeah, I want to hear about what you learned there. And somehow they made a phone system sexy. I mean, yeah. somehow they made it right. intriguing and exciting because I, I heard about it many, many times and looked at it. Yeah. Why would I have heard of a phone routing system? You know, they just did a fantastic job. Yeah, marketing. They, they, they really did. And I think the brilliance, uh, the, 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 the brilliant moment is when they decided that they were going to make their phone system synonymous with the word entrepreneur. Mm. And this was the phone system for entrepreneurs. And entrepreneur is a very, that's kind of an aspirational word for a lot of people. And so when somebody has decided, they've made the decision, I'm going to become an entrepreneur and they buy their domain, they, you know, they name the company, they get business cards and they also get a toll free number. Yeah. From Grasshopper. So they became part of that. They tried to position themselves as part of that, you know, the first five or six things you do as an entrepreneur mm. that was that was really powerful for them. Yeah. yeah. So what lessons did you learn working at uh, Grasshopper? Uh, I mean that was my education in building software products um, from you know from start to finish. Um, they gave me an amazing opportunity. I was part of this team called Grasshopper Labs mm-hmm. which was basically an R&D group within mm. the company. You seem to and pick up these cool jobs throughout your career. Totally random. Yeah. It was just like yeah. Um but our basically our charter was to create other software products outside of the phone system mm. that would sell into the same market. Yeah. And so the first one I worked on was called Chargeify. Yeah. That's so, I've yeah, I've definitely heard of it. People I mean, that's a standalone product. I didn't even realize that it came from Grasshopper. Yep. Yep. They went on to raise money from Mark Cuban and they're doing really well and that team has has grown and they've just it's a it's an awesome product. I mean, it's like in the same space as like Stripe and right. Brain Free and that kind of thing. So yeah. what did it look like early on? What charge if I look like? Well, I mean, we the, the problem that we were solving is yeah. that the billing system we had built for Grasshopper was like totally crazy and we had had to like roll our own billing system. And so the, the initial idea was we're going to build an, uh, a billing system that could power Grasshopper but make it completely accessible to third-party developers. Mm-hmm. And so they don't have to do all these integrations with payment gateways and yeah. build out the ability to track usage and different subscription plans. And yeah. so basically we built the, bis- the billing system that we wish we had. Um, so it's a subscription billing system, right? It is, yeah, yeah, but it can handle it can handle like metered billing and all different you know, all of these edge cases that we had uh, with Grasshopper, mm-hmm. and um, you know, so it got some customer management tools and reporting and analytics. Excuse me. Um, so I mean, it's turned into this amazingly robust uh, product for recurring billing. Mm-hmm. And then Spreadable was another. Spreadable was yep. That was the second product that I worked on, and that was again spurred by. Uh, an insight that we had uh, uh, sort of uncovered that like 60% of the signups that we got on a monthly basis were coming from word of mouth from referrals Mm -hmm. of our existing customers. And so we said, you know, how can we build a technology product that encourages that behavior? Right. So it was kind of like a really simple widget for people to share either via email or social media, kind of like if you're familiar with add this, like it's a a sharing tool. Okay. And so basically it allowed our customers to share an offer with somebody that they knew mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. get 
basically there was an incentive for them to share and an incentive for the other person to sign up. Yeah. And we tried to productize that idea and sell it to other businesses. Yeah. Uh, I, I ask about it because not everything works as well as Chargify or Grasshopper. No. And in, in the parentheses, um, you have Deadpool on your yeah. LinkedIn. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't yep. want to give the perception like, oh, you just fill this need and you create this product and it blows up and you get investment from uh, our Cuban, but some things don't work. So that, talk that about one, that. Yeah. Yeah. That one blew up. So that was the first product that I'd worked on that failed miserably. Um, and it's a failure in the sense that like when you're talking about the scale of Grasshopper and you're talking about investing in another product uh, at the same rate, there was just no possible way that it could have ever made it to the scale of a Grasshopper-esque you know, sort of business. Yeah. And so from an investment... Why do you think it didn't work? It's a good question. I think the business model was wrong. Um, creating a referral program like this is a fairly involved process. Um, and we were trying to sell the software just like we sell Grasshopper, which is completely self-serve for like you know 20 mm. bucks a month. Right. And I definitely think that Spreadable, and actually other businesses have proven this, it's more of an enterprise level, not enterprise, but like it's not a $20 a month product. It might be a $2,000 or $3,000 wow. a month product um, that requires more like Rejoiner, more of a collaborative Some approach, yeah. different, different customer. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. So were you going to RISD while you were working at Grasshopper? Yes. You were? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I, I did continuing ed at RISD while I was at Continuum and then continued mm. to, to do it at Grasshopper. Wow. Yeah, so I was just taking coursework that I thought was interesting. Right. Like brand strategy. Because that's one of the top ones in the country, right, for design and – Yeah. 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 Like, um, I mean a lot of uh, – uh, it, it's really gotten – it's really been in the spotlight recently because like the founders of Airbnb are RISD grads. They did industrial design degrees right. at, at, uh, at RISD. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's a great school. So what was a big learning from there? Because I know like some entrepreneurs are on the other side of the spectrum, like don't go to school, just learn from hard knocks and start a company. And yeah. obviously there's value in in going to and doing that. So what did you learn from RISD? Yeah, I think it, it just further reinforced my appreciation for design and being detail oriented. And my I think my favorite course I took there was actually one on brand strategy mm. and what are the the facets of of creating a brand from positioning yeah. to your unique value proposition, and then my favorite part of it is like the visual design of a brand. How does yeah. that manifest in what a brand a brand looks like and what it stands for? Yeah. So, what do you mean by that visual design of a brand? So, like, actually, like, what when you when you like go to rejoiner dot com, like, there's a lot of decisions that were made about the visual look and feel, the typography, the mm -hmm. look of the logo, the color scheme. Yeah. Um, you, you know, so all of the elements that make up what you feel when you experience uh, a, a brand, and that's the part that really got me excited. Yeah, I mean, I could tell a lot of thought went into that. The site. So, what's something that people wouldn't see on the surface? So, when I look on there, you know, the rejoiners on the, the top left, it's green. You have the green sub headline and the big headline. What's what's something most people that's subtle that they don't even pick up, but that that really you really thought long and hard about with the brand yeah, strategy. I think, like on the logo specifically, yeah. you, you can see that it's got like a little tilt to it. And there's also a ligature mark on the R. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, tell me about that. Yeah. So really the thinking behind that is that we wanted it to feel like it was always in continuous motion because mm. of what our software does is always in continuous motion. It's automated. It's, it's, it's always moving. Um, and so, subconsciously we wanted the logo to communicate something like that. So I don't know if we were successful, but that was the, the thinking. Behind yeah. It. Well, so when you're at grasshopper now, I mean, you created, um, this paint, you know, there was a pain there and that's when kind of the, the seed of rejoiner. Mm -hmm. So why did they say, okay, Mike, stay on grasshopper and just, we're going to launch this rejoiner thing as a separate company. Yeah, that was a tricky. It was a tricky scenario where we had developed this technology while we were working there. Yeah, we had deployed it on Grasshopper, right, as the first user, right, and we had to convince them 
essentially to say because you know you sign a, a, a non-invention agreement that basically says anything you create while you work for us is ours right on top of the fact that they were using it <laughs> and so uh, we had to go to them <laughs> tell me say, how you convinced me. yes <laughs> well in in our case I, I think the 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 key part of the discussion was that it's part of their DNA. It's part of the grasshopper brand that they are empowering entrepreneurs, yeah. and encouraging entrepreneurs. And we were able to go to them and say like, Hey, we really want to take a shot at commercializing this. Yeah. Can you let us out of the non-invention agreement mm-hmm. that we signed? Yeah. And like, they were totally into it. They yeah. were like, go for it. And so, yeah, it really, it really wasn't a big deal. We, we made it a big deal internally, but when we actually went to them and said, Hey, here's yeah. what we want it's to do. It's just because of their, their culture that it wasn't it, that big of a deal. To, not, not a big deal at all. Yeah. yeah, because I could see it being a big deal, even with someone whose culture it is, because they're like, okay, they're thinking we have these great people, and if this becomes successful, they're now going to leave They're going to leave our company. Yep. yep. But I think... Besides the monetary aspect of, you know, they created on company time or whatever, but they're going to lose you as, exactly. a, as an employee. Yeah, but I think the unique... So how'd about- that discussion go when you went to them? Well, the unique thing about those guys is that actually that they would consider that a success. If someone learned enough yeah. to go out and feel confident enough to start their own thing, right. then you know, that's I, I think they would feel successful in that, wow, like we've built an organization where somebody felt like they could take away enough from what right. they were doing on a day to day basis to go take a shot at this. Right. And you know, they've encouraged other people, not just not just myself. Mm-hmm. Um there are other, a lot of other entrepreneurs have come out of the grasshopper you know, sort of family. Yeah. I do think that's a sign of success. Like if you look at Google or whoever, how many you know, people have created separate companies from coming out of that culture. Yeah. Um, but I can see from the company standpoint, it's like we don't want to lose Mike also. Right. right. You know? Well, and the, I think the other thing is like when those stories go out and people tell the stories about what it's like working there, it actually, it's, it's a very powerful recruiting tool. Yeah. And and people who have entrepreneurial aspirations or you know that uh, that culture they appeal, attract those people appeals to them. It's like wow, this is the place for me. So tell me, how long were you working on it once you started Rejoiner while you were at Grasshopper, and then you decided, okay, like we got a we got a flight on our own. Yeah, um, it was probably a year and a half where we worked on it nights and weekends. Yeah, kind of tuned things and and tried to get the experience right and launched the initial version of the application and so it's a it perfect was a, scenario i mean you have like a big pain for and you have a customer there yep. in grasshopper yep and they're still a customer right um <laughs> yep. uh, yeah so it, it was it so was, was a year and a half yeah at least it might have been longer but i mean it was a long time because like you know we're we're working on this you know at night after work right you know? so it took it took a while to so get what was it at that year and a half or whatever point that was that you finally decide okay we need to it was a hard decision right it was still like barely even a product like i think we had when i left my full-time job yeah i think we had 10 customers maybe maybe um but we had something that zero it's better than zero (laughs) but like we still were really far from (laughs) being anywhere um so what made you decide to leave at that point it was about focus for me because i think I was, you know, I, I, I was working on a project at Grasshopper that was sort of all-consuming. We were like developing the um, iPhone app for the phone system, and so I was working a ton on that. And I really wasn't able to spend much time on on uh, Rejoiner stuff. And I was just like, you know, there's there's really no other there's there's not going to be a better time than now. So yeah. I'm just gonna just gonna go for it. And so yeah. I left, and then my my two original partners continued to work full time. And so that created a whole another set of problems right. that I was now going full force and they were yeah. still having the same time constraint issues. Right. So how do you navigate that? Yeah. Um, not well because they're no longer with the company, but <laughs> um, you know, it could, created a whole set of, of, of problems around, you know, you have a person who is dedicating everything they have to something and then you have you know, two other guys yeah. who, you know, it's hard for them to, especially given their, you know, home situations and they have families and they have young kids and um, they can't just, it's a scary thing to just make that leap exactly yep yeah exactly and that ended up unfortunately breaking up the original founding team was that issue was that 
based on their circumstances and our sort of um, uh, uh, you know, the, the size of the yeah. business and the amount of funding that we had, they couldn't they couldn't take that leap. They couldn't take that risk. Yeah. So, Mike, and you know, I know there's certain personal details you can't share in that, but for someone who's going through that now, like maybe they went full time and they're spending a ton of time and their original co-founder who they started with big aspirations with decided to stay in whatever their full time because it's of the safety security. Yep. How did you navigate that? Yeah. Um, transparency around sort of the real commitment. And but I, I think the mistake that we made is that we didn't have alignment, the three of us around what it was we actually wanted out of this, you know, this process of building yeah. a business together and what we were willing to give up to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And once things started to move and we started to acquire more customers, you know, it became clear that there were differing, you know, sort of motivations as to why, why we were doing this yeah. and, and the risk that was uh, able to be taken. And so, you know, for somebody who's in that situation now, I would say, like, try to have that conversation about what are their real goals and their real aspirations and whether those are realistic for each yeah. member of the team, like, as early in the process as possible, because it was too late for us by the time we had those conversations. There was, like, you know, too much animosity um, about... You yeah, know, you don't want to have resentment if you're working 18 hours a day on something and then someone works for a half hour after work or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. And it's like, you know, hey, I'll get to that thing where you worked all day to, you know, get a, a, a demo and a customer requested something and yeah. you need to change the product and, you know, they don't have time to, to, to support you. Yeah. Because um, it just creates a situation where there's too much yeah. friction. Yeah. And I can see on the flip side, they're like, well, I helped start this thing and, you know, there's arguments there too. So what conversation, the other part about it makes me think, Mike, in the beginning, if you did have that conversation, would that have halted the whole project you know like let's say you have that conversation how do you think that would have played out if you go back and you're like okay we should have had this conversation in the beginning and you told them your goals and they told yours do you think the project would have continued probably not nope i don't think it so would have it may have been better that you didn't have that conversation in a sense well for me for me certainly i i think it was better because mm -hmm. I continued to go, I continued to work on it full time and focus on it and grow it. And, you know, but the byproduct of that is that I had, you know, we had a couple of years of really tough times where we're just scraping by. Um, I didn't take a salary for the first year. So, um, you know, it's not like that was yeah. an easy thing to do, but I think if right. we had had the conversation earlier, yeah, I'm not sure we all would have, yeah. I'm not sure would have continued. Yeah. So talk about that for a second. That first year, no salary. And that's reality for people starting companies, maybe more than a year. You know, talk to people. It was, that, yeah, it was, it, it was more than a year. Yeah. Actually, a year and a half. So how do you survive with no salary during that time when you you know this is going to work? I mean, you saw your parents, right? It took a, You have that template of this took a while. This isn't going to be overnight success. But how, you still have to survive. Yeah. I, so I, I describe this as my... Um, my seed round. This should be in your letter, by the way. But go on. Whatever you're going to say right now. My, my, my seed round was... Like, I didn't eat for two years to right, get the right. product. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, basically, actually, that's not too far from the truth. But um, I cashed in a bunch of mutual funds that I had. I cashed in uh, an IRA that I had, and I paid the penalties on it. I had about... I think I had about 40K in savings. Okay. And the thing that really got me was that I had to sell. I I, uh, I, I like to sail, and I had a sailboat for a couple of years. Mm. I had to sell my sell my sailboat. Um, but that combined, I don't know. Maybe that was like sixty or seventy k. Kind of got okay. me so you had a, you had a runway a year and a half. Yeah. yeah. So how long did you project that was going to give you? I had I didn't do any projections. Okay. I just said I've got seventy k. I'm going to try to make it last as long as I can. Right. Um, and at that point, I was able to start take, taking a little bit of money out of the business, but it's still a major lifestyle change to go from you know doing pretty well uh, at Grasshopper to do you know making nothing for you know, almost two years. You you eat what you kill. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, and that's the motivation, right? That's I mean, I, I feel like in a lot of ways that was the driver was like either this is going to work or I'm going to be in big trouble financially. Um, and so you have to go out and sell. Right. You have to do cold calls. You have to cold email. There's no choice because that's the only option. Right. So what worked with getting customers? 
mean, uh, the first ten I think is pretty good. By the time you leave the company, getting having ten customers, I don't know. I don't see that as uh, bad at all. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but you know, the, that first first ten customers represents like a thousand dollars a month in revenue, maybe at the most, right? And so yeah. it's, you're still just covering. You're not even covering your infrastructure costs at that point. So, yeah. um, what worked was writing. Uh, we wrote, we created as much content that was relevant to the audience that we were trying to sell to as possible. Mm -hmm. And we were lucky in that some of these emerging communities like inbound.org and, um, some other marketing communities, we were able to distribute that content and get a somewhat good return as as far as awareness is concerned. Mm -hmm. And so we just kept writing. How did you finally... We're at that point where you right now you're focused a lot on e-commerce businesses, obviously, right? Yep. yep. How has that changed? What was it like then? We were, we thought we originally we thought that we were going to sell Rejoiner to other companies like Grasshopper, other mm-hmm. software companies, and the organic pull was not that. It was not software mm-hmm. companies. It was re, it was retailers um, who were showing up and signing up and requesting demos, mm-hmm. and so why do you think? Because I could see the SaaS, okay, it's a recurring, it, it'd be, if they get someone, it's, it's definitely worth it because they have that recurring customer. Yeah. Why do you think that pull was for e-commerce? Two reasons. Um, I think retailers are more likely to be tracking that problem on a day-to-day basis. So it's more ta- the, the problem is more tangible. Like from a, a revenue perspective, they can see the revenue that they're losing every day. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is that the, the issue that we ran into with software companies early on is that they, basically if they had a team of developers, they would they would look at the solution and be like, oh, we could build that. I see. And so rather than try to convince them otherwise, we decided to double down on the market that was sort of more inherently it was, what we were doing was, was resonating with them more inherently. Yeah. And we work with a lot of software companies now, um, but the product really had to evolve from a technical yeah. perspective and get more sophisticated to the point where it, it wasn't a something where developers felt like they could just reproduce it, you know, in a week. Yeah. So I want to talk about that, how the product evolved, but um, still go on with the, how you got customers. So you would reach out, you really honed in on the audience. What else worked? Um, so yeah, it was, it was content, it was writing, it was distributing that content. Um, and then the other thing is we have the luxury of the, the customers that we serve are, somewhat easy to find in that they are essentially grouped into um, based on the different e-commerce platforms that they use. And so there's a, you know, hundreds of open source and hosted e-commerce like platforms. people who are on Shopify or people exactly. who are on big commerce or something like yep. that. Yep. So the most important thing for us early on was to go to those platforms and try to build relationships yeah. with the folks who manage, like every one of these platforms has an app store, you know, yeah. it's like they stay, they have these add-ons that they can bolt yeah. on. And so it was really important for us to go build those relationships and then also build the add-ons to get into the, the store and then work mm. with them to get promoted to the, that base of customers. Yeah. Cause I did notice there's an integration section and I'm sure that was also well thought of like who, who do you spend your time, money and resources integrating with? Yeah, and it's and it's tough to tell because a lot of these platforms they have you know they say they've got twenty thousand stores. Well, in a lot of cases, how many got, are successful? They've got nineteen thousand stores that don't do anything, and they've got a thousand successful ones. Right. And so you got, kind of got to dig through and, and try to find the the gems. Yeah. So who are the best integration, best decision integrations that you made? Yeah, definitely the open source platforms as opposed to the hosted platforms. Hmm. So hosted are like um, Volusion, BigCommerce, um, Shopify. Um, we have better luck with open source platforms hmm. like uh, WooCommerce, NopCommerce, Magento. Hmm. And the reason for that is, is that they're usually a little bit more flexible from a third-party development standpoint. So I it makes, gives us the ability to do more with our add-ons versus the hosted platforms, which are a little bit more rigid. Yeah. Who do you find to be the best fit customers for you? Like, you're like, well, if I know if this person comes in from WooCommerce, like they are a good fit for us or yep. I don't know what that looks like. Yeah. Um, so certainly a customer who is on one of the platforms we support has that 5,000 to 10,000 unique minimum threshold <clears throat> on a monthly basis. Um, I'm, they have some kind of marketing budget um, and that they're, they're, they feel like 
it's, it's important that a customer feels like they're not getting the most out of their email program as possible. Yeah. And it's like the combination of those, of those four things is how we gauge fit with like a potential, potential yeah. customer. So a current co-founder, Mike, is Eddie. Yep. So how did you meet Eddie? Uh, Eddie was customer number two. Okay. For, how did he for, find you? He got a referral from, I think, either one of his colleagues or like maybe it might have even been a buddy of his who was in e-commerce. But um, he had was currently, the, the guy who referred him was somebody who was currently like trying out the software. We used to have a 30-day trial back in the day. Um, and so I built a relationship with him. He referred me to Ed and then... Um, you know, immediately we deployed the solution to his two e-commerce mm. businesses. He's a successful e-commerce entrepreneur right. and you, you know, you know, that, you know that you've, you've yeah. spoken with him and immediately there was a fit. The software started working really well. Yeah. Um, and he I, does for people who don't know car parts, essentially right? car parts. Yep. Yeah. He is, his site autoplicity.com is essentially, he's trying to be the Amazon of auto parts and, um, you know, his, his background is he's, he's been building successful e-com businesses in that arena for the last 10 years. Yeah. Um, and there was just a great fit culturally. Like we really liked each other. We liked working with each other. He started to, you know, really be vocal from a product perspective. Yeah. Like he was like the perfect definition of an early adopter. He's perfect for you. Yeah. He started to shape what we were doing and what yeah. we were building. Yeah. And Tell me about that. What are some of the insights? What did he do? What did he say that, that shaped it? Yeah, I mean, from a uh, he helped us build out our analytics. Like, what are we reporting on as far as campaign success? You know, he wanted us to do a Google Analytics integration, so we did that. Um, he gave us a lens to look at what we were doing from our customers' perspective, completely objective in the beginning because he had no stake in the business, right? Right. And so, essentially, you know, he's he's every decision that we're making, we're running by him in the beginning, whether it's pricing or messaging or product stuff. Right. And he and he's being like, yeah, actually, I don't really care about that. <laughs> we're like, oh, it's shit. a perfect, <laughs> perfect, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that relationship just grew over time, and then um, you know, we 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 decided that it would make sense for him to to join on in like you know, sort of in that capacity as the voice of the customer, um, but also. You know, helping us with sales, business development, partnerships. Yeah. He's really well networked in our industry. He knows a lot of people, and so you know, it just made sense to to, to bring him in. And he invested yeah. a little bit of money, and and um, you know, here we are today. So, what are some big breakthroughs you had with the product because of it? Could have been because of his insights, or just the evolution of the product. Yeah, the biggest one was expanding our thinking beyond card abandonment. Okay. And, and, and solving for this very, we feel like our product had solved that very narrow use case, like to the maximum degree, we solved that problem mm -hmm. and we needed to figure out what was next. Right. Yeah. And it was thinking more holistically about customer life cycle versus just one very specific part of the customer life cycle. Mm -hmm. And from an architectural standpoint, the product was not even close to supporting all of that other, you know, all those other campaigns that we talked about. Mm -hmm. And so it was building out the roadmap to say, okay, here's what we want to do. We want to be able to address the, the entire spectrum of from start to finish of a relation, you know, a customer relationship. Right. That an e company How did had. you come to that? It was just because you had reached the, okay, we've done everything of card abandonment. What's next? Or was it something that someone said that sparked? That. Yeah, I mean, it was a combination of both. It was feedback we were getting from customers. It was the fact that we felt like we had solved the card abandonment use case. And it was also, we needed to figure out a way to upsell and cross-sell um, into our existing customer base. And so we had this group of, you know, let's say 150 really successful customers. Well, it, you know, the question was, how can we make these customers more valuable? Yeah. What else can we do for them? Yeah, how can you serve them? Yep. And you're also more protected as a company doing more things. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and the things fit together really well. So it's not like we went off and we did some other, you know, completely right. different idea. It was very closely tied to yeah. what we were doing. So how long into it, Mike, did you then start to develop the the rest of the life cycle? Like the timeline. Yeah. Oh, uh, gosh. 
we launched Lifecycle like in April of last year. And so we did card abandonment for two and a half years. Okay. That's the only thing that we did. Yeah. I yeah. just want to give people a sense of it's not like six months later you're doing something else. I mean, you were just toiling away at this and getting yep. that right before kind of moving on to the next thing. Yeah, we're talking years in yeah. each phase, not you know, not months. In the early days, you know, when Eddie's like, okay, I need this integration, I need that, you're bootstrapping. How do you get this done and all these changes done? You have to say no a lot, <laughs> unfortunately. I mean, do you have like a team of developers? How do you, yep. how do you, yeah. Yeah, so that was another big thing is like when the original founders, when we parted ways, I had to rebuild the engineering team. Right. And so, it's not easy to do. No, no, it's not. Luckily, at Grasshopper, I had all, all this experience with building remote engineering teams. That's how we were building the, the Grasshopper Labs team. That's what it was. It was um, you know, really talented engineers working yeah. all over the world building software products. And so yeah. I had to essentially say, okay, now's the time to do that um, with, with Rejoiner. So I had to go out and, uh, you know, went, we, gosh, we went through so many developers early on where it just didn't work out or there wasn't a fit or you know, the, um, the, the commitment wasn't, wasn't there. And then we had, um, we finally found one. We finally found a crew of guys, uh, in Poland actually. So overseas. Yeah. And how did you end up finding them? I got a referral from another entrepreneur that I knew, uh, who'd had a really good experience with them mm -hmm. and we've been working with them for, um, gosh, almost three years now. Yeah. Are people protective over their developers though? Like your friend gave you this, if he's using them, he's like, well, I don't want you taking them from me. Or was it, you know, I only use them for this amount of time. You can have them too. What's, what's the, I guess, typical reaction you get? I, I, I would say that people are protective, yeah. definitely. Um, in his case, I think he was transitioning where maybe they had helped him build the first iteration and he was transitioning to an in-house team. Um, and so it made sense for him to make the referral. Um, yeah. He's also just a really, really good guy. So. Yeah. So other lessons, insights from Eddie that you, that have been valuable. Yeah. Um, Eddie is from a fundraising perspective. He's, he's gone through that process with, and, and, and we're sort of in that process now and he's gone through that with, with his other business. So that's been really valuable. Um, from a general hiring recruiting standpoint, he's built teams of, 10, 20, 30 people. So he's, he's experienced all of the stages of, of growing a, a, a new business and, and you know, the, the processes that you have to put in place at each stage. And that changes, you know, from the point at which you're like three guys in a room to the point at which you're seven or eight people to 15 people and, and right. all the process changes that come with that. And so I think like the biggest lessons that he's been able to, to help us, you know, sort of leapfrog a lot of mistakes is on like operational stuff. Like mm -hmm. how do we grow the business and make it efficient from an operational perspective? Yeah. So how do you get big customers like Hallmark? Like I mentioned in the beginning, you've gotten some, some really big customers. Um, yep. How did you get them? Um, it's, it's a combination of things. There's no one like silver bullet where all of our customers come from. So it's, it's a combination of still content is a really core part of what we do. So creating guides and articles and getting those things to rank organically and pushing paid traffic into those resources. Um, and then it turns into just kind of your standard, you know, sales funnel where it's like, you know, contact suspect, marketing qualified lead, sales qualified lead, and that whole process for larger customers. Um, we find that most of them want to be in that process. Like they want a sales process to, to happen with there's a discovery call and a demo and a technical feasibility call. And it's a fairly involved. Yeah. You're very hands on hands on. Yep. Yep. And then there are customers who find us, um, through either agencies that we work with or other customers referring. Um, so it's, it's a combination of like, uh, organic search, marketing, paid search referrals, agency relationships, and those platform relationships still drive a lot of customers too. Yeah. So Mike, you were talking about the you know beginning, the card abandonment, now the life cycle email. So what do you see? What's next? What's the future for rejoiner? What's uh, in the pipeline that you're like, okay, this is what we want to go to? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, definitely more um, 
more sort of different types of triggers, different types of e-commerce triggers. So like we talked about a few, like the welcome series, the win back, the card abandonment campaigns. We've got uh, a lot of really cool ideas for different tr- triggers that maybe aren't so common. They're a little bit more nuanced, uh, more data driven. And so expanding the types of campaigns and the events that they trigger on is, yeah. is, is what we're focused on next. And you could do that because within the software, you have that data and you have the, the integration or whatever it is to to do that. Yeah, so exactly. So what would be an example of a nuanced segmentation that yeah. without rejoiner you may not be able to, to do? Yep. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking at ways to target customers who are a little bit further up in the funnel. And so like card abandonment targets a customer with high purchase intent. The post-purchase campaigns target customers who are already customers. But there are a whole lot of events that happen before a customer gets to the cart where it presents an opportunity for us to use automated email to, to drive conversion. So like a really good example of one would be um, like a price drop campaign. And so it sounds fairly straightforward, but you're letting a customer know when the price of an item that they're interested has changed, mm-hmm. gone down, mm-hmm. preferably. But it actually, from a technical perspective, requires a ton of work to be able to recognize when prices change. Do that in a scalable way across all of our customers who are sending us that data. And so now that one works really well because it's very Let's contextual. Yeah. So it's like the customer has expressed, we need to be able to define the business rules, right? So customer looks at product page XYZ eight times and so they qualify for that segment and then need to be able to recognize when the retailer changes that price, be able to recognize the event and use it and do that using our existing integration. So nothing yeah. else required. Uh, on behalf of the retailer. So that's yeah. one that we're, we're looking at for uh, 2016. Yeah. So Mike, how do you, I want to hear about the softwares you use to run the business because this sounds like, I mean, there's so many different things here that you're talking about. I mean, you, you're talking about sales, yep. r- managing a team, probably hiring, thinking about what's currently you need to work on on the software and then currently what you need to want to include in the software. So tell me about how you manage all this stuff. Yeah. Um, we use a lot, we use a lot of software. Um, so I've got, you know, a two screen set up on one screen. I've got, there, there are a few applications that are always open. Um, so we use Slack for team communication. Mm-hmm. Um, we use Trello for product roadmap. Yeah. Uh, we actually use, um, a, a, an automation, a marketing automation system that's geared for B2B. Um, we're a marketing automation system for e-commerce, but we use one called Active Campaign. Oh yeah, sure. Which sure. which helps us with like auto response. They're in Chicago. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We love those guys. Um, we use Close.io for CRM, so like deal tracking and, and tracking what stage uh, certain uh, leads are at. Yeah. Um, for client collaboration, we use Basecamp. So all of the things that we talked about, like doing design work and copywriting and those kinds of things. So that's where like the main interface for clients is taking place. Mm -hmm. And then we've got, you know, like obviously Google analytics, we use a tool called tool called attribution app, which helps us track where our marketing leads come from and, Mm -hmm. and figure out like where the most valuable, um, most valuable customers are coming from. And then I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's more, but those are the ones that are, I'm I'm, I'm using most of the time. I'd like to hear. Yeah. What, because like I was mentioning in the beginning, like I really am an evangelist for things that save me time. And that's why I, I, you know, I only have companies on like acuity scheduling that saves me hours and hours a week that I want other people to know about that I use. So I'm wondering, I was wondering what yours are that save you tons of time because you're very busy. We, um, we actually on the scheduling front, we actually just deployed a solution called time kit. Mm Mm-hmm. So it allows customers to like when normally when you go into a sales process, right, you fill out a form and then there's emails that go back and forth and you got to find a time that works. And we actually deployed the solution called TimeKit where the schedule is available right on our demo request page. So mm-hmm. somebody book a time right yeah, there. Yeah, Qt is the same. Yeah, you embed it in easy. there. Exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. you have to schedule a lot of, you know, do scheduling with. Yeah, clients too. And I'm sh- I'm sure you know, like people are rescheduling, they're canceling, they're moving stuff, and so we wanted to like totally remove that back and forth from the process, and it's been it's been really nice. Oh, it's huge. Yeah. So, Mike, this has been awesome. Um, so thank you so much. I have thanks for having a me. A couple of final questions. Um, 
and then I want you to tell people, obviously we could point them towards wherever you want, which is rejoiner.com. Sure. Um, but I always ask because it's inspired insider, um, two things. One, what's been the lowest moment and then how you push through it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say the lowest moment was in the beginning where we had built the product, things looked promising, we had customers. On paper, we had an amazing team. Um, and then we went out and in you know sort of very typical startup fashion, we tried to do the accelerator thing. We tried to do Y Combinator, mm. we tried to do Techstars. Um, we, we, we tried Techstars first and we made it to the final 15 or so companies. Is this in did. Boston or New York? This is, or? This is in Boston. Okay. Yeah. And we didn't, we didn't make that one. Why we do you think? High, we had high hopes. Um, what's interesting is that they had the same concerns about the team that I didn't know existed yet, which mm. was the fact that I was working full time and the other two guys weren't. And they told us that. And I was like, no, no, that's not, not, not an issue. They're going to, they're going to be ready soon. Right. Um, and then we actually we also made it to the finals for Y Combinator, and we flew out to Palo Alto. Yeah, you know, we the met three with, of you, the three of us. Yeah, we met with like Gary Tan and Paul Buckheit, the guy who invented Gmail, and um, that's pretty cool. Yeah. We felt we did really well. We we're like so excited, and, and um, you know, it turns out we didn't get in there either, and so we got rejected mm -hmm. from both. And did they give you reasons why, why not Y Combinator? Uh, or do they give you feedback on the spot? What kind of feedback were they giving you on the spot? They, I mean, Y Combinator, the, the interview process is drastically different from Techstars. The interview is like 10 minutes. And they basically just pepper you with all of these really insightful questions to see how you think and to see if you really understand the opportunity that you're going after. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you know, we had practiced for days beforehand, but you can't prepare for the questions that they're going to ask what you. What were some of the questions? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I think Gary Gary Tan asked one where he was like, we had explained what the product does. And he goes, what is this the Trojan horse for? This is idea. What is, it, what is it a Trojan horse for? And like what he was getting at, I, you know, and you had to stop and pause and think about it. But what, you know, what he's getting at is what's the bigger idea here? Like, you know, clearly you've built this little piece of technology that works. Like what, what's the bigger vision? Mm -hmm. um, so how do you answer that? I'm, I, I don't even remember. Oh, yeah. I'm sure, we just started like babbling and rambling. <laughs> um, but anyway, so yeah, both of those things were very high points where there was a lot of excitement about the possibilities of what could happen, and also very low points when you find out that yeah. you know they don't think that you're the right fit. And so yeah. that's really when things started to fall apart from a co-founder perspective, mm. because I felt like one a win in either of those would mean would be the catalyst for the other two guys to Quit. be like. All right, this is real. Like we're doing it. Right. And that didn't happen. And so it was, um, you know, that I, I, you know, probably got lower from there, but it was, that's really where things started to, to implode, um, from a founding team perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And so on the flip side of that, Mike, what's been one of the proudest moments? Yeah. Um, I'm going to go with our first million in revenue. Mm. So what was that like? Very proud moment, but it, like I don't think it was the elation that I expected. It was kind of just like, okay, we hit it. Like we did it. Got to keep going. Like what's the next thing? And it wasn't a thing where it was like, you know, we threw a party. It was just like, okay, like, you know. When, you, when that happened, what did you think back on? You know, did you think back on a certain moment? Like I remember when I was – there and now i'm here yeah i mean i i think i'm, I'm not sure it was a reflective moment for me actually mm -hmm. i think it was more i was more forward thinking mm. than reflective yeah um in you know i think the interesting part about it was that it took us many years to get to that point but it felt like it was only the beginning at that point like we just were just getting started on what's possible and so yeah, I mean, of course, it felt great, but I, you know, it was it was definitely more of a, um, you know, this is just one milestone to hit. There are many more that are going to come in the future. Yeah. What point did you feel that 
the wind was at, I mean, you're a sailor, right? The, the wind was just pushing you and you were just flowing. Probably when we made like, when we, when we, when the team got to the point where we were like maybe four people and we had like three other people besides me doing stuff. And so like our team is amazing and they're like all brilliant at what they do. And so when, when things started to move on their own without me having to intervene and things like from a marketing perspective, from a sales perspective, from a design perspective, Mm -hmm. these are, you know, our amazing team where where they were bringing their own ideas and pushing this forward. And it was like, you know, like as a founder, you're like, Oh my gosh, like, I can't believe these people are like, you know, like, they're helping us grow. And like, it's such a magical moment to realize that you've, you've built a team and they're um, all rallied around the same goal. And it's like, you know, I've been building this myself for three years. Like what's going on? Like we've got these great people now. Right. Yeah. I love that. Mike, thank you so much. Where should we point people towards um, on Rejoiner? What should they check out? Yeah, check out rejoiner.com if you're interested in marketing automation for e-commerce, lifecycle email. We, we create a lot of great content about um, how e-commerce companies can use uh, email to grow their businesses uh, faster. We've got like um, a really cool email gallery that we're launching, which is like we're going to basically catalog all of the great e-commerce email examples um, on our site for people to use for, for inspiration. That's going to be launching next week. Yeah. Um, so check out our blog, and if anybody wants to, to email me directly, I'll put my uh, my email address. You know, maybe you can put it in the show notes or something. But um, I'm happy to have a conversation with yeah. anybody who's, who's inter- interested in this stuff. Yeah, everyone, go to rejoiner.com. Check it out. Mike spent a long t- amount of time toiling over every detail, so <laughs> I appreciate that. Mike, thank you so much. I really Thanks appreciate for having it. Me. Cool.